Okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, Ramadan Mubarak uh, from uh, Birmingham Jamaat and also on behalf of uh, uh, the DBWS Management Committee. Um, so we're going to uh, start our first, inshallah, of four uh, Ramadan lectures um, every Saturday uh, evening at around about five o'clock, although I think it'll be about an hour later uh, next week because of the time, time change. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, we've had um, some uh, Ramadan uh, greetings from Chris Hewer. Um, so he joined us 15 years ago, I think, uh, but he's in touch with mum and dad quite regularly. So he sent his salams to, to the whole Jama'at. Um, and today uh, we've got uh, uh, Brother Sayyid uh, Imran Taqawi with us. Um, so he's uh, currently studying at the Al Mahdi Institute. Um, and so uh, for those who uh, know the Al Mahdi Institute, we've had a lot of um, those people uh, a lot of the students come and lecture with us. Um, so he's going to give us uh, the first lecture, inshallah. He'll hopefully run for about an hour, but he's told us um, he's going to look and see how many people start falling asleep. So we'll we'll play by ear. Um, and also we will have a short, um, if we have time and the saliva, um, we'll have a short Q&A, inshallah. Okay, so let me just hand over to uh, Brother Imran. Yeah, I want to speak for Shall I? أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيره اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجه برد الوان السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته as is a uh, prophetic tradition, uh, people did not even accept from the Prophet وسلم, whatever he had to offer or say unless he introduced himself. So he went on top of the mountain. He says, do you know who I am? Majority said, yes, we know who you are. Some of them were traders who had come into Medina or Mecca at that time and said, we know you're from an esteemed family but we do not know who you are as a person. So he says, those who know me, know me, and who don't know me, I am Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, from the tribe of Quraysh, from the family Bani Hashim. And then he started to say what he had to say. So in honoring that tradition, my name is Sayyid Amran. I am a student at the Al-Mahdi Institute. I'm currently pursuing my master's in Islamic studies at the University of Birmingham. For the last 18 years, I was in the seminary in uh, Qom, in Iran, for those who know. I was doing my Arabic studies. I was doing Quran linguistics. I was doing Hadith. Yeah. But my subject of expertise, or the subject I was working with for the longest time was philosophy and mysticism, as we know it in Islam. Uh, some subjects were covered from the uh, Western philosophy but mostly I was involved with Islamic philosophy. But one subject that was the foundation or the fundamental subject that I thoroughly enjoyed and I took it along with me throughout my whole career was the love or the affinity I have for the Arabic language, which is the language of the Quran. It is the language Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for us to speak. How such, as we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all powerful, all knowing, he has his wisdom and he behaves according to his wisdom. He chooses the time and place of how things are to play out. And in the time of the revelation of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thought it fit that Arabic be the medium that Allah communicates in that medium with his people. There's many reasons for that. At that time, in that particular instance, in that place, the Arabic language had developed such 
where it was absolutely ready to convey the message that was intended. The nature of that message is that it is divine, it is light, but it required to be able to transfer that information, which is from the heavens, to us human beings through a messenger. And was the perfect medium. Because it had the city to convey, it had the elasticity to explain and express. For instance, you have a young child, and uh, I'm a father of three children, so I know uh, when they get angry, and I, I understand tantrums. I'm trying to relate to them. Uh, it's good my wife is more well versed in this regard. Uh, I'm just a patient one. So um, what happens in a child is he feels the emotions you feel, the anger. He feels the, the loss. He feels an attachment, disattachment. But he does not have the vocabulary to express his emotions. So he starts stomping his feet. He starts crying, wailing, yelling, shouting, because he lacks expression in speech. The vocabulary is limited. So he has to use other means to express what is, sorry, what is contained within him so you can relate and understand to the turmoil that exists within his small being, contained in that small stature. As he matures, as he grows, he is now able to communicate more fluently, sometimes multiple languages. It's like, I'm very angry. So three languages, he's told you he's not happy with the situation, the status quo. Because he's maturing, he's growing. The books that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in their particular time, the medium then was good enough, well enough, to be used at the medium to transfer the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then came Arabia, then came Arabs, and then came this language called Arabic. An example of how the Arabic language works, the reason I'm talking about the Arabic language, we'll come back to the Quran, we'll come back to Shah Ramadan, is because the essence of how we spoke, if I was to explain Chinese technology, and I do not understand anything from China or their culture, or the language of the society, I am, would be the most unfit person to speak about that society, those people, that technology. Or if I was to come up here and speak in Russian and then hope everybody understands and everyone's like, you know, he's a guest, we should be nice to him. We just nod, clap, laugh at the end. But um, Arabic is the book Allah sent to us, is the book we look up to. It is the language Imam Hussain spoke. It is the language Imam Ali spoke. It is the language he taught his people. So if you want to relate, if you want to Speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some basic understanding of this language and how intricate this language is to the Quran, to what we do in ziyarat, to how we relate to the Imams, Imam Ali, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussain, would help us. This is going against uh, my profession and my camaraderie. This will help eliminate the middleman. Now you're in direct connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now you're in direct connection with the Quran. Now you're in direct connection with the teachings of Muhammad and Al Muhammad Ali Musa. Because, uh, as is my, and I, I know many people who've learned many things over their lives here, you'd rather learn a language and read the book in that particular language than read a translation. Because many things are lost in translation. If I was to sing a beautiful song in the Hindi language, and people who admire the art of poetry and admire the art of uh, eloquence and how poetry is written would appreciate that song. But imagine translating that song and then expressing that song. Many things are lost. It then comes back to me how good of a translator I am, how in deep my depth and my knowledge is of the English language, and then how the language moves on. Arabic has this uh, ability to be able to contain many emotions, many sentiments to transfer them. After that, we have the Urdu language, which I also am a uh, big supporter of because I believe Urdu has most elas more elasticity than the Arabic language because Urdu takes from Arabic, it takes from Sanskrit, it takes from Turkish, but this was later on and Allah had already revealed his last book, so there's no debate in there. 
Okay, but Arabic, <clears throat> and how does Arabic function and how does Arabic operate? Those who understand the Arabic language, those who speak the Arabic language, uh, those who are acquainted with the Arabic language would understand that the Arabs understood the function or the nature of how the language word and the, the words carry a sentiment and emotion. For instance, it is very easy for me when I'm trying to explain uh, to people who do not know what a uh, what shir birinj is. Shir birinj is just a word, a Persian word. I said shir birinj, and everyone's thinking what shir birinj is. If I was to present to you how in Urdu we say kir, the sweet, the dessert, you're like, oh, I, I know this. And I know this is shir birinj. You say, no, no, this is kir. The problem is then in the language, but it is the easiest form of explaining to you what it means when I present it in front of you in the physical form. Then there's no need for words or communication. That is why the Sufis, the awliya, the ulama, the awsiya, the urafa would say, there comes a point in human development, a human understanding, where there's no need for words. But there's silence. Because I and you and everybody present here will reach a stage where we witness. And there's no reason to speak and say, oh, this is what we call it. In the Quran, when the mu'mineen are brought in the heaven, he says fruit. He says, we've had this before. But no one's commenting or saying anything. He says, because you're at a point of witnessing when you're in awe. You arrive at a point where you understand. And there's no reason to explain because you see what I see. And we all marvel in the beauty of what is present in front of us. But since we're not there yet, just yet, we're limited with words. And we have to see how the Arabs used the language. So an example, um, in the Arabic, what you called a seed, a seed that a farmer plants is called a hab. A and two baz. When put together, it's called a ram, you put a shadda on it. It's called hab. So you plant that seed, and then you water it, you take care of it, there's a sapling, it germinates, it grows, there's a stem, leaves, there's flower, it becomes a tree down the road. It's called a hub. When reading the Arabic, do understand then different words which share the same root, because Arabic words with root letters. So dahaba, zahibun, zihabun, madhabun. These all may have different meanings when you look at them in different templates, but the root is dal, ha, and ba. And there's Something very intricate. There's a soul, common soul they share. So hab is seed. But the Arabic word for love is hub. And they both share the same root. You understand the nature of love for how Arabs use the meaning in seed. You plant love. You water love. The love grows. You take care of it. They understand the nature of love because the root it shares with the third thing. If you can conjugate Arabic words like that, it gives a new and a deeper and a distinct and a different meaning to how we understand things. How do human beings operate? See, we can only create or invent in things which are familiar to us. Sorry, I'm going to keep on doing that. It just happened. This is how we create. When I remember when the uh, movie, The Avatar came out once upon a time, like 15, 20 years ago, and they said, oh, he's created a new planet. There's new organisms there. It's just different. It's this whole universe he's created, this director. I showed up, I'm like, that's a horse, it's just blue, right? That's a waterfall, it's just falling from the sky into the sky and there's, there's no water source. What he's done is he's reframed Everything that is already in creation, because, and again, I'm open to suggestions in the Q&A. Your imagination is limited by your knowledge. You cannot imagine something you do not know. You may arrive at new information based on the raw material you feed your imagination from observation. That's why they say man faqada hissan faqada ilma. Person who loses a sense loses an aspect of knowledge. 
a blind man, I am yet to ask if he can imagine colors. You can explain to him the concept of colors. You can tell him how black is distinct from white, how pink is, there's so many shades now. I just call it pink, but my wife has this, it's just, it's not the right pink always. <laughs> but for a blind person, these things, they mean nothing. So to be able to connect and relate, it just slightly decreased than how we are connecting and relating because our imagination is connected to and bound by and is dependent on the knowledge we have. This is the expanse or the extent of our intellectual skill prowess. That is also one of the reasons why the Prophet had to be connected to Wahid. Epistemologically, as a human being in the realm that he shares with us, he is also limited to the information we have. But the Prophet says, Ma basharun, inni ana basharun, fully I am a human being. But there's a difference between myself and yourself. Yuha ilayya. I am connected to the higher realm with revelation. A revelation that extends our intellect far and beyond. Revelation then gives us access to a source of knowledge that myself, yourself, any third person who's not a messenger, not a prophet, it is closed off to. But what we do have is dreams sometimes. What do we have is intuition sometimes. What do we have is this blessed month. This month of Shahar Ramadan, this month of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ali alayhi salatu salam in a tradition says, he says, don't say Ramadan came, Ramadan left. It is Ramadan. He says Ramadan is one of the very sacred names of Allah. Say Shahar Ramadan. Say the holy month of Ramadan. Don't just say Ramadan came and left. It says understand this month stands out from the rest of the 11 months. This month is special. Why? Because what we are trying to achieve in this month is to cleanse ourselves, to clean ourselves, to make ourselves devoid of our basic, fundamental, earthly attachments to attain a spiritual elevated high. The spiritual high, not just every high. I'm going to put this again. We'll say this again. Spiritual highs. We're talking about spiritual highs right now. The Imam Ali said to one of his companions, he says, Mutu. He says, People are sleeping. He says, People are sleeping. When they die, will they awaken? So imagine you go up to your teacher, someone who's very esteemed, and you say, Ali, teach me something. He says, People are sleeping says, this makes no sense to me. He says, when they die, they'll, they'll learn. He says, I'm still not learning anything. Then the Imam says, Mutu qablan tamutu. Die before you die. Ali ibn Abi Talib, how does one die before you die? And this is the month to practice death before it's time. What is death? It's watered down if simplified, very simply put, a separation, a disattachment, a disengagement. This is death. You're taken away from your family, from your friends, from things you like, from your possessions, your assets, everything that identified you, everything that made you. If you would sit down and say, this is who I am. If you write a bio data, my father, my mother, my brother, my siblings, my qualifications, my education, my degrees, my assets. This is me. Death says no. You are what I am taking with me. This is not you. So who are you? What are you? This month. 
everything and anything you need, which is a fundamental for basic human survival, Allah says, start cutting it off slowly and slowly. Don't drink. Don't eat. Abstain from this. Abstain from that. Why? Because slowly when you start detaching your physical body, your heart will start detaching. Death will come easy to someone who has nothing to lose. Some people are very ready to leave this world. I've met some uh, in, 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 in my experience, I've had meeting different people, some older fellows, some younger people. They're very easy. They're very ready to pass away because they're disattached. They're not connected. They're not attached. They're not holding on. They don't want to keep something, sustain something. It's easy for them to just let go. And some people have had a very difficult time. Unfortunate. Because we do have to leave one day. And when Imam Ali salam, says, Mutu qablam di mutu, detach yourself before death comes and takes you away. And the riwayah we says is like the lovers of Imam Hussein when they leave this earth, their ruh leaves their body. It's how a good smell or a perfume leaves the flower, or the scent of the flower leaves the flower. It doesn't damage the flower, and the scent is everywhere present. Or some people will leave with fall marks. It's just how the nature of life is. Coming back to the less the scary subjects. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I did not think this was going to happen reaction but thank you so much for listening but this is the month we're blessed to be here people who were with us today in the third of Ramadan maybe have passed on I know at least two people who I was with in the third of Ramadan last year are not with me this year they passed away they moved on someone somewhere up there has decided and has chosen that this year Shah Ramadan you will be sitting here and you will witness the feast of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah's prayer. Allah will invite you to sit down and take whatever it is you desire. It's very interesting. On one hand, the idea is of detachment, giving up, letting go. Don't eat food, feel the pain of your brother Muslim. Mu'min. Human being. Be human for a bit. Don't hoard, hoard, hoard. Detach. And on the other hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there is a big sufra. Have a seat. Ask what you want. So we understand that the nature of what we were holding on to and what Allah has to offer is fundamentally different. What we want is material. What he is offering is immaterial. What we want is limited with time and place. What he's offering is infinite. It feeds our soul. It elevates our ruh. It connects us to a higher realm, which is divine. This is the month of divinity where not only do we sit at the sufra of the divine, he wants us to emanate and manifest divinity. He says, become like me, the image. And it's very wonderful because I am of a belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything that he knows chooses when certain things are supposed to happen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands for me to give them the best of gifts, which is the Quran. This is the ayah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Surah Baqarah, ayah 185, which I was supposed to start with. So uh, now we're starting. He says, Shahru Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, الذي Unzila fihi al-Qur'an hudan hil-nasi wa bayinatin min al-huda wa al-furqan. Allahu Akbar. He says, what is the month of Ramadan? He says, the month of Ramadan, the one where the Qur'an is revealed. See, this is how you introduce someone. When I came here, and he's like, oh, there's Brother Imran speaking. Okay. We never heard of Brother Imran. AMI, he's like, ah, we know AMI. 
So something familiar, you know, Allah says, I'm going to use that as a point of reference to talk about this month. But the ayah is very interesting here. Ramadan was known, Quran was unknown. In our case, AMI is known, Imran is unknown. Allah uses the unknown to tell you about something you already know. It says the Quran is not unknown. The Quran is as manifest, if not more manifest than Ramadan. You think you know Ramadan. Let the Quran tell you what Ramadan is. Let the Quran tell you what Ramadan is. This is how it's very interesting. It goes against all principles of introducing something. That's why the Quran says it's like they know the book, like they know the name of their mothers. They know the, they know the book like they know their children. Because they're so connected and attached to the book, which is the Quran. It says this is the month of Ramadan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in this month, the Quran. How do we make the most of the Quran with the Quran? How do we benefit the most? Just reading it, reciting it, doing tadabbur, tafakkur, listening to lectures, better quality of lectures, bigger speakers, bigger scholars who've studied the Quran, who've gone in depth with the Quran. Engaging and involving yourself with just the Quran. In essence, for the kids to understand. Uh, what's your name? Adil. How are you, Adil? Okay. All right. So, Adil, I have a, I have a friend who works. Um, I don't know what they say here in the UK, but who works in, um, he works with trash, garbage, right? He has to work in the municipality. His job is to clean sewers all day, right? And I go hang out with him for eight hours a day. For let's say two days, I'm just with my friend and we're working in the sewage. How will I smell when I come out? Yeah, yeah, you can imagine, yes. <laughs> Am I cleaning the sewers? No. Am I doing the dirty work? No. I'm just a companion to my friend who works in the sewers. Adil understands that. His friend over there understands that. Now imagine uh, my friend works in a perfume store. He owns a store which sends all the beautiful, all the nice scents in the world, different brands. And I hang out with him for two days. How do I smell when I leave the store? Amazing, right? Good. He understands that, I understand that. Now if my companion is the Quran, I may not make the most benefit. I didn't go to my friend's store in the perfumery and just start spraying myself with perfumes, right? No, I did not do that. I just was sat in that place where perfume was in the air. If the Quran is not, is not my companion, what is my life? And if the Quran does indeed become my companion, even if I don't know the very deep Arabic, even if I don't understand many things, it's just Quran playing in the air. My personal experience growing up is um, I did not start reading the Quran when I was four or five, I think six, not after that. But my mother was in the habit of playing the Quran, reciting the Quran. There was always Quran on, on the radio, on, on the TV, even in school in Abu Dhabi where I grew up. Uh, when you went to school till the time they had the first assembly at like, we got there at 7.30, started at 8. In the playground, they were just playing the Quran. We were kids, we were just playing around, playing football, playing catch, whatever. When I did start reading the Quran as an adult, when I did start learning the Quran, many things came to me easy. Like you would start an ayah and I'm like, I know where this ayah finishes. I know how this ayah ends. It's not because something active. It was just that the passive being in the environment has helped me or given me the foundation to work on and be with the Quran. Just being with a friend, depending on his occupation, his workplace, or we hang, hangs out, has an effect on my body. Surrounding yourself in the Quran and Muhammad and Al Muhammad, just surrounding yourself, putting yourself in that environment will have that effect on you. You want it, you do not want it. It's you can't help it sometimes. This is the month for it. And Alhamdulillah, this is a big blessing. That 
there's a there's a community here and I sense the sense of community here and that you have each other to help each other out in the problems they're facing in uh, just loneliness. I did not know before I came to the UK that there's a minister for loneliness here. Apparently there's a minister for loneliness here. This is the only country where there's a minister for loneliness because people are lonely. It's a big adab to be lonely. To be alone is one thing. I know many people who are alone, but they're not lonely. And I know many people who are in a crowd and they're lonely because they cannot connect. Because they cannot connect. Because they cannot identify. And once you do not have that self-identification, once you do not know who you are, you do not know who to connect with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ana jalisu man dhakarani. Whoever calls out for me. We have the ayah from the Quran. Call out, I will respond. Allah says, no, this is a this is a higher stage. It says, just mention me and you will find me beside you. Ana jalisu man dhakarani. I am the companion of the one who just makes a dhikr of myself. He says, Ya Allah, we will find. He's not asking me anything. He says, He will find me beside him. And this camaraderie, Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase the love you have for each other in your heart, uh, coupled by the love of the Prophet وسلم, and his family, the love of Allah, the love of the Quran, the love of all that is good. But uh, it is indeed a big blessing. Use this month, make the most of this month. Understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen or destined for us in this month. When we sit, going back to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you're here invited, you're sitting on the sufra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what do we ask? Understand the nature of Allah first. Allah is kareem. Again, going back to linguistics, there's a difference between sakhawa, which is someone is sakhi, the word in Arabic, and there's a man who's kareem. Ibn Battuta was sakhi. What does it mean? He'll have lots of money and he'll give lots of money. But if you want to take money from this, uh, this man, sorry, Ibn Battuta was an uh, explorer. Uh, Ibn Battuta was a great grandson. Hatim Attai, you have to line up and you say, this is what I need and he would never reject you. He says, he'll take. He was so generous in giving that once he passed away, his brother wanted to take his place. And he decided, you know, because Hatim Attai would sit on his member or his chair in his office and be multiple avenues you'd come to. So you had the right window, you had the main entrance, you had the left window. So once his brother sat in his place, a man came from the right side and then he turned around and he came from the main gate. He says, I just gave you here. He says, your brother never asked me that question. He gave me from all sides. This is Sakhawa, this is Sakhi. This is Sakhawa, this is Sakhi. But Kareem is Imam Hassan alayhi salatu salam. Kareem is Imam Hussain alayhi salatu salam. Huh? You know the difference between Karama and Sakhawa? Kareem is someone who would not look at your face when he's giving because he does not want to see the embarrassment in your eyes. Imam Hassan wanted to help someone out. He went behind the door. He says, Imam, I want to see you. Imam says, I don't want to see you. What do you want? He says, I want this and this money. He's like, no, I don't want to see you. Here's the money. When asked, like, why Imam Hassan? Why did you behave as such? He says, I did not want to see the embarrassment in his eye. I did not even care who he was. This is a next level where he protects your integrity. Your dignity is intact and you've gotten what you wanted. Allah is kareem. Allah doesn't use the word safi for himself. Hassan showed what karam was. Hussein showed what karam is. Why? Because they had to tell you. It's like you see this karama? Wait till you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wait till you see the karam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See how Allah is kareem. Now he's put the spread. Now ask. Seek what you want. Ask what you want. Whatever it is you desire. You want the dunya, I'll give you the dunya. It's going against the spirit of what is wanted, but okay. 
Ask for something more. What do you want from me? Ask me for myself and I'll give you myself. And use all of these things, the fasting, the waking up, the nawafil, the Quran. And this is the objective. What do you want? What is your objective? What is your goal? What is your resolution from Shah Ramadan? Is to cleanse myself. It comes with training. Much training. But this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he wants to give someone, he can give it to him overnight. Some people he just likes to see, put that extra effort. In, in, in Iran, when they do their say akhlaq, they use this uh, anecdote of Layla in Majnoon a lot. And, and they, share, they say that Allah is your beloved. You have to try all hila, all attempts. You have to try everything to get his attention. And once you have his attention, then you have everything you want. So ask him, be intimate with the one who's alone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He'll allow that for you to happen. Because he's created you for this. And in hadith, in hadith Qudsi, when asked, it's like, Allah, why did you create creation? It's like, Kuntu kanzan makhfiya. I was a hidden treasure. Fahtabtu an yu'raf. I loved to be known. Like, I want people. Fakhalaftu al So I created creation. For the love they know me. And when they know me, they fall in love with me. I fall in love with them. There's a hadith, I do not have much time to speak on this, but I want to mention this hadith because it is an absolute manifestation of love. And I, I will open the floor to questions if you have more questions in regard to this hadith. But yes, this hadith talks about Nabi Musa was told in loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Man talabani wajadani. Whoever sought me, Allah says, whoever sought me out. Talabani, you say talib ilm, someone who wants to study. Whoever left his home to seek me out, wajadani, he's found me. Whoever looks for me will find me. Faman wajadani, arafani. Whoever found me will start to know me. He's found me, now he'll start to understand me because he started to see. Man arafani, ahabbani. Whoever starts to know me, starts falling in love with me. Who seeks me will find me, who will find me will get to know me, who will get to know me will start falling in love with me. When Whoever falls in love with me, now he's hopelessly in love with me. Ishq. He's hopelessly in love with me. Yes? Waman ashiqani qataltuhu. And whoever fell in love with me hopelessly, I kill him. Qataltuhu. I kill him. There's no. Resolve. There's no living after falling in love with Allah hopelessly. Again, ashiqa goes back to a root word which is Arabic. Ayn shin and qaf, ushqun, is a vine, V I N E spelled vines like a herb, which grows around uh, a, a tree. And it, it, uh, it envelops the tree or it revolves around the tree and the whole purpose of this vine is to give extra nutrition to that tree and die in the process. This is Ishq. I will give all of myself to you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, whoever falls hopelessly in love with me, I will kill him. He says, now that I've killed this poor man or woman or person, miskeen. He says, now that I've killed him, I have to give him blood money. Diya in Islam. When, when somebody kills somebody, you have to do qasas and you have to pay dia, an amount of money, camels to the family. It's like now that I've killed him, I have to pay dia. I have to give some blood money. He says, whoever I kill, fa'ana dia to who? I am his blood money. He says, I am the prize. I am the reward. He is mine and I am his. So it works in stages. And we start with the self-purification, this month we find months. The month is here to help us. The days are here to help us. Your sleep is tasbih, the Imam says. You have, you're fasting, you go to sleep. Allah tells the angels, they don't stop counting, keep counting, he's fasting. Keep counting, keep counting, is hasanat, he's fasting. What a blessed month. Now an excuse for my parents. Like, what were you doing, ibadat? 
<laughs> which type? It's between me and Allah. <laughs> right? But yes, so sacred, so blessed, so different, so divine. It's only for us to reflect and grow and prosper and become. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this hadith I had here, he says people should take the first, the, the month of Ramadan to be the first month of the year for themselves. So there's new resolutions and use that resolve and the energy you have to then take you across to the next chapter. Because you will get a boost of energy. You will get a spiritual high. You will get this new deeper understanding, this nuance, reading the Quran, sitting in the Quran, being with the Muslim, eating together, praying together, uh, will help you or will project you in that, direct, in that direction where the trajectory will take you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is Salatul Mustaqim. Um, so this is how, uh, with your jaza, I'd like to stop speaking here, and uh, I'll, I'll take the questions. Please recite the salawat from the Prophet. <laughs> So uh, if anyone has any questions, just feel free. Uh, for all those on Zoom, uh, if you have any questions uh, for Brother Imran, then please uh, type them into the chat and then we can we can ask them, inshallah. Thank you. Come in. Do you think it's... Oh, you talked about uh, getting one's attention. In human relations, retaining that uh, attention is the challenge. How do we sort of um, achieve that with Allah? So I'm, I'm just talking about myself, that getting it is easy when I'm praying or doing that little bit of ibadah, but then retaining it is more challenging. How do we work on that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, uh, is always paying attention. It's, uh, it's, it's us that sometimes we pay attention, sometimes we don't pay attention. Yes, I understand uh, because we learn with our relationships and how we have to, every relationship requires some work. Um, many times, many people take a relationship for granted. But most of times it's a husband and wife because there's certain expectations which are just there. And uh, it's because of the lack of maturity. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to your question, but just to say um, how you take for granted is when I became a father first um, and my child was crying at night, I'm like, um, I asked my wife, I'm like, why aren't you doing this? <laughs> She's like, what do I do? I'm like, you're a mother, you're supposed to know what to do. Like, there's not a switch that goes on. I'm learning like you're learning. I'm like, I thought you just knew because now you're a mother, you know, right? Is because of the lack of maturity from my part. I didn't understand. For it's as new for my wife as it is for myself. It's a learning experience. Um, if, if my kids know how lost them at sometimes in related to their issues, there'd be authoritative problems at home. <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes to a relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and, and it comes from maturity, uh, is the reason that the imams don't sin is because they understand that we always is present and is watching us. Uh, the holy month of Ramadan is one where you've got his attention. Somebody asked uh, an alim, and he said, "Is like, how do I know? Uh, am I appreciating my imam? Like, if I'm if I'm giving the imam the value. See, for us, the uh, Isna Ashari, the imam Mamati says, if my connection with the imam is it strong." He said, it depends on the connection you have to the Qur'an. If your connection with the Qur'an is strong, your connection with the Imam is strong. But if this Qur'an is something you put on a shelf and it comes out when every time somebody gets married, there's a jinn on the house, there's you're scared or there's problems, then the Imam and your relationship with the Qur'an. Because when the Prophet left this world, he says, I'm leaving the Qur'an and I'm leaving the Albert. They have to be together on a balance. 
So your connection with the Quran will tell you about the connection you have with the Ahlul Bayt, and your connection with the Ahlul Bayt will tell you how deeply and profoundly you understand the Quran. It's how we keep uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attention is uh, on a very basic fundamental level, we have to set up reminders for ourselves. Um, like all relationships, you have to remember the anniversaries and the birthdays and special occasions when you first met, when this happened, first time that happened. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is He has those dates. He has the time for prayers. Those are His dates. You have to remember those dates. You have to honor those dates, like in relationships. If this is the day I got married to my wife, I have to remember that date and it has to be special. If this is the month Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for me, I have to make it special. He's made it special. He's done everything he was supposed to do. Now my part in that relationship is how I honor this month. And you take it uh, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, and you make it special. So... Um, yeah, this is, this is how Allah situated us. We learn from our experiences. And thank you so much for giving that tip on relationships and how they work. This is the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah wants to see you in a place, Imam Hussain was asked, he says, how do I obey Allah? Imam Hussain says, This is the problem with man is he doesn't know Allah. If he knew Allah, he would worship Allah. He says, we keep telling him, like, worship Allah, worship Allah, worship Allah. Kids standing on the Danamah's day. I don't know him. What am I? Who am I talking to? What is his role in my life? What is the utility of his function? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that he knows the role of Allah in his life. His heart will yearn to worship. You fall in love in a directly. If you know someone loves you, just myself and brother Akhil, if you have a relationship of respect and honor and love, and all he does is keep giving me, I have nothing else to give him but love. I have nothing else to return to him with favors, even if I have nothing to offer. Right? And, he, and he keeps showering me with love and abundance and respect, no matter, irrespective of who I am. That love will just, will just grow. Because like that seed that I talked about earlier, the hub, everything is, the water is there, the environment is suitable, the minerals are coming, the farmers taking care, the bagban, the, the gardeners taking care, love will then grow. So if all these things are kept in place, you're fasting. Imam Hussain when asked, is like, how do I develop the love of Allah? He says, what Allah has told you be, to be, be in those places. There's certain places Allah said, be here. When it's namaz time, be on the musalla. When it's ziyar time, be in the ham Imam Hussain. And when Allah says, don't be, I don't want a monument to be seen here. He says, don't go to those places. Don't do those things. It's very simple. I put it made, made it very simple, but uh, there's many things a human being is fighting. That's why the community is very important. The person alone cannot overcome many, many things. My teacher, when I in 2004, my first uh, principal, when I went to come to study, he said, "Say, hey, Imran, um, you're young, but take my advice." And I still remember it after 20 years. 20 years. He says, always put yourself, situate yourself in positions where you're forced to be good. Situate yourself in places, situations, stations where you're forced to be good. There's no room for you to make mistakes. It's like certain things you would never do in front of your father. And if you know you're getting or falling to the habit of doing this, place yourself always in front of your father. It's like use these security things, use these blocks. If you dress a certain way, I, I'm not going to, they won't let me in certain places if I'm dressed like this, right? So I just, I'm safe right now. If I go outside, I change my clothes, many places become open for me. I can show up in many places, many people don't know who I am. It's easy to camouflage and hide. But if I put myself in this, and I've restricted myself, bound myself with this clothes, it is an example, then there's many things I restrict myself. So also in that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah has put his love also in the heart of the mu'mineen. So you might find yourself on a given day that you're just under, uh, the battery is not that complete. You meet a friend, he smiles at you. you he reminds you of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That goes a long way. That's what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says. 
the the smallest amount of charity is looking at a fellow Muslim or a Mormon and smiling at him. Because, and we don't understand this, like smiling is sadaqa. Now you understand when psychology is studying, because uh, I, I plan on starting my master's in uh, psychology and psychotherapy and counseling. So I, that's why I bring this up. It's the prophet says, smile to a brother, it's sadaqa. Someone who's going through someone, someone who's contemplating suicide, your smile can change his life. The Prophet said this 1400 years ago, and we thought, what kind of sadaqah is this? Smiling at someone. He says, no, the Prophet says, smile at him. Tell him he's not alone. Assure him of his existence. Tell him he matters to you. Tell him he's important. So these small things add up. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once he takes your hand, then let us know we learn many things. Inshallah. If there's any other question? Is hopefully some of it was answered. Does it matter? Is is there any question? Sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, you speak Gujarati as well. I understand some of it. Sometimes we 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 pray. Not sometimes we pray. We pray. Some of us pray pretty regularly. We do our charities. We do our other that. Um, and then we, we, we hear about the Allah's love, that Allah loves us, whatever we are, however we are, because we are reading namaz and we're doing the charity and we're doing the sadaqa, etc. But if Allah is love, how do we bring the love in the hearts where we actually create a love surrounded by, well, as well as how we love Allah. Do you understand what I'm saying? I observe. Um, so, uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. So, this is the love that we are doing, that we understand that we are doing love with us. We are like we are. We want to be like we are. If that love is the love that we are doing, how do we bring it in our lives? the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how it manifests it the best way or the best example for the absolute manifestation of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Imam Hussain and Isaf. I don't see a higher example, a bigger uh, performance, a bigger manifest open uh, language of expression than Imam Hussain alayhi salatu salam. Uh, Abu Dwayne, uh, read those du'as, or uh, there's a book that talks about the lectures of Imam Hussain, especially the things he said on the day of Ashura, when uh, he went to collect the, uh, the body of Ali Akbar, when he was standing at the, his dying, the side of his dying brother, when he and Ali Asghar, this is all him expressing love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Imam Hussain talking about Allah. Imam Hussain became the uh, epitome or manifest love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the basic, bunyadi, fundamental reason is Hussain was selfless. See, being selflessness is the closest thing to being godly. When you're selfless, you have nothing to give except for love. When you think you possess and you own something, if I give him this, I won't have this. When there's an I and this material, you cannot love. Love does not understand possession. Any Anything, any uh, feeling, sentiment, or when love wants to possess, it is not love. Keep filtering it out. Keep revising your intention. Because love, once it takes root, then there's nothing stopping love from happening. And Imam Hussain is the perfect, because we know nobody else who gets love like Imam Hussain. We know nobody else who's loved like Imam Hussain. On the plains of battle, when he left his khayma and he kept going to the enemy, he, what he was saying, 
He's still inviting them to the last minute. He said, oh, creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I do not want you to be damned to hell. Listen to what I have to say. It's not Hussein speaking. This is the hujjah of Allah speaking. This is the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To love selflessly, and I just summarize this, is to see no self at all. Have you heard the story of uh, the mother of Abbas, Ummul Banin, when she got married and she came to the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib? Her name was Fatima. Her name was Fatima. She was called Ummul Mani, the mother of Abbas. One of the things narrated is that she said, Ali, Amil Mumini, you're my husband and my name is Fatima, but don't call me Fatima anymore. Why do you not call me Fatima anymore? Because these children, Hassan, saying their mother is Fatima. Every time you call me Fatima, they will be reminded of their mother. So give me another name. Call me something else. You know what is happening here? This is the mother of Abbas. What's happening is here is you may not love anything like you, like you love yourself. I've been in an uh, earthquake. This is interesting. Uh, I've been in an earthquake and I've, you witness, because this is human instinct, I've seen mothers run away and then come back for their children. Because basic human instinct is to save yourself first. And then once she comes to, she comes back for her kids. But that one instant of her leaving shows the true nature of man. You love yourself more than anything else. But do you train yourself to become selfless? This is a training. This is a procedure you have to go through. What did the mother of Abbas do? She sacrificed her identity. She told Ali, I grew up in a certain household. I was called a name. This was my identity. This is who I identify as. This is who I am. I'm ready, ready to forego all of this for the love of your two kids. A mother like this befits to have a son like Abbas. Yes? Because she forgo. This was selflessness. And when this selflessness came in, love manifest was born and Ali called him Abbas. Selflessness would be summarized in love. Hopefully that answered your question. I can also listen in Farsi or Arabic if anyone's interested. <laughs> we had one question in Urdu. Is this Gujarati? I understand. Uh, some of you, I'm just not able to speak. Sometimes those words just don't come in English. So. Ah, I'm a big proponent of that, yes. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, Jazakallah. Um, thank you for that. Uh, thought-provoking um, sentiments. Um, I think I have to go home and check my wardrobe just to make sure <laughs> to block myself out of certain places. Um, so um, that concludes, obviously, a uh, lecture for today. Um, inshallah, we'll hear more uh, from uh, Brother Imran in, in the future uh, as he develops, inshallah. Um, and then we're going to try and do the same thing uh, next Saturday, inshallah, with, uh, with a different speaker. So... Um, Yeah, we've already had beautiful presentations. So just uh, it's already started coming in. So thank you for that. Um, so yeah, inshallah, we'll turn off the Zoom. Um, everyone have a um, belly filled iftar, inshallah, and uh, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Can I just speak?